This is the Volleyball Coaching Wizards podcast, covering everything coaching. Motivated and inspired by interviews and conversations with some of the world's great volleyball coaches. To learn more about the project, visit VolleyballCoachingWizards.com. Now here are your hosts, John Foreman and Mark Lebedew. Welcome to episode 14 of the podcast. Uh, Tom Turco motivates this discussion with uh, some comments that he made in his interview regarding how he deals with uh, the post-match discussion with the team. Uh, Tom is a, a high school coach from Massachusetts who's won 17 state titles and at one point I think had a 110 match winning streak over the course of uh, several seasons. This particular quote gives us an opportunity to kind of delve into uh, the different ways coaches approach post-game, whether they do it intentionally and consciously or not, and the potential impact that that can have on the team, not only in the moment, but also moving forward. So uh, enjoy. End of the match. Do you talk with the team very much or do you leave that? No. No, no. We, no, not at all. No, basically, especially if we lose, uh, I think the best thing to do is just say, you know, and it doesn't happen very often. I'm not bragging. It's just statistically it doesn't happen that often. Um, you know, I think the safest thing a coach can say is, you know, hey, tough match. I'm sure you're as disappointed as I am, and, uh, you know, we'll take a look at the film and, and we'll we'll talk about it tomorrow. Right. Because, the, you know, they don't want to be yelled and screamed at, they don't want to be, you know, a real good program, real good team, they're, they're as upset as you are, so. Um, right. Well, then, you know, you get to cool down, and I don't know about you, but I, I, I tell my players, uh, you know, occasionally throughout the season, if I see you in school or, or now I'm retired, I might, I might just shoot you a text after I see the match on film. Because the match I see on film is, is, Sometimes a totally different match than I see while I'm looking at the scoreboard. You know, so mm-hmm. and you know, sometimes these kids make these great, great plays that you miss. You know, in 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 the uh, you know, in the excitement of it all, I guess. Yeah. So, and and you'll see these kids, these you know, these kids that that won't get the names in the paper, but they'll. They'll bring that ball back up at, at an important time. They might have six digs in the match, but one of those was just a game changer. So, you know, we just, we just, you know, it's important for them to know that that what happens during a match, I don't get it all. Yeah, you know, I don't get it until I sit down and watch the film. So, yeah, that uh, that bit by Tom there, where especially when he talks about not getting into any sort of heavy discussion at the end of a, a match, uh, particularly after losing, which, as he admits, doesn't happen very often in his case, um, is something that uh, definitely resonates with me. Um, I use the same philosophy myself, and in large part because I've seen coaches, and I've even been on staff with coaches, who have really led into teams afterwards, and it's just awful to watch because the, the kids – already are feeling bad for losing, especially if they lost after playing poorly and they knew they played poorly. And then when the coach just kind of rips them for all sorts of different reasons that have nothing to do with the kids, mm-hmm. it ends up being a lot more to do with the coach. It's just, you know, I sat back there as just kind of as a stunned witness going, oh, this is just not good, not good. So that's one of those things that I picked up along the way and kind of the, the I will not do what my, you know, what the coaches I used to work for have done. Yep. Uh, yeah. yeah, I, uh, I, I go backwards and forwards on this one, and, and have done over over a large number. Well, I have it's a large-ish number of years now because the the traditional way, the conventional way, of course, is to is you give the the team a, a motivational pre-match address, and then a, a, after the match a, a review. A review of the game to to go on with and and that's the way that I started working um, uh, maybe not so much the motivational speech part but but at least 
talking to the team at the end of the at the end of the game. And there are a couple of things that specific things that happened to me that uh, that changed my mind. Um, they're sort of related to each other. And one one was making mistakes in the post match address. So. Uh, particularly after after losing and and not shouting at the team or anything, but just making factually incorrect statements on account of um, not remembering correctly what happened. So um, the after the match, the the first things that that are in your mind are are always through the lens of the emotions of the of the situation and the emotions that you had at the time. So. Um, emotions are, are wonderful for some things, but not always good for remembering things very well. And about the same time that I was uh, going through that particular experience, because I remember at least one time that I very, uh, yeah, where I did not shout, but was a little bit harsh in a in a post match uh, time, but post post match address. And was incorrect in things I said. And around the same time, I read some stuff from Jose Mourinho, and uh, and he talked about it quite quite a lot. That he would make his notes during the first half of the match, and then use those notes to address the team at half time and make whatever changes he needed to make or whatever. And then in the second half, he would put his notebook down and not use it because he never spoke to the team after the match and and his reasoning was was pretty much uh, as i as i suggested that you don't remember it particularly well and it's better to be correct and uh calm and um analytical makes it seem cold as well but um you know but along those lines and so i figured if it was good enough for Mourinho, it's and uh, it fits in with my experience, then uh, it must be good. Right. And and there is a tendency, and this isn't just volleyball coaches, but this is with everything, that we'll remember the first thing and we'll remember the last thing, but we miss, you know, misremember, forget, whatever, the stuff that happens in the middle sometimes. Um, I, you, you're, you can forget which is the player that made the mistake or uh, what the score was when the mistake was made. And you remember an egregious mistake as being um, game-changing or game-decisive, but when you look at the video, you discover it was actually at 4-all in the, in the set and not at 19-all or, you know, I, all of that stuff's happened to me. Got the player wrong and... Um, uh, not accused, but uh, sort of, yeah, accused a player of not paying attention or something, and it wasn't him. It, it right. Wasn't. And, and Tom actually makes a very similar point in, in saying that he waits until he goes back and reviews the video, and partly because of what you just said. Sometimes you misremember, or because of your perspective, you didn't see it properly, either, or you didn't see it at all. You know that happens a lot because we stand in a certain per- a certain place. Yes, and sometimes the angle just is not very good to understand what happened in a play. Um, not that the camera angles are always perfect, but you know it's it's at least different from what we see. Um, yeah. And, and Tom's other point was, you know, you, you're talking about some of the negative stuff where you kind of pick on a mistake, or maybe you pick the wrong player, or the wrong time in the match, or whatever. But he also said the other way around, where sometimes you see something that a player did that was positive that maybe he didn't get recognized yeah. and, and should be recognized. And so mm-hmm. he mentions, you know, maybe the next day he'll, he'll message the kid and say, Hey, you know, you, that was a fantastic dig you had when, when it was 2020 or, you yeah. know, whatever, or that decision you made with your set was really, really good. Um, so it's, it's not just, you know, the negative side of things. It's also the positive side of things as well. I completely agree. But I did say that I'd gone back and forth on this and now I address the team after the games because uh, I I spent some time with uh, Vital Heinen and uh, Vital is, uh, is one of life's talkers in general, but, uh, but he always addressed the team after the game and he 
uh, and I asked him why we had a discussion about it because at that time I, I wasn't for the reasons that we've just discussed and and he said yes those things are uh, those things are important and true but the uh, the coach's address after the game gives a chance gives the coach a chance to influence the dialogue that the players have amongst themselves about the game. So the, the I don't know what, if this counts as priming, um, the psychological effect of priming or, or whatever it is, but by, by speaking directly after the match, before the players have a chance to form their own opinion, for want of a better description, uh, you can influence the way they go about the next period of time and the way they talk about the match amongst themselves. And uh, for him, that was more important to be able to influence that period than um, you know, necessarily to be factually correct. And with me, uh, what I pay attention to, knowing the first thing, but w still wanting to speak to the the team, is I just pay a little bit of attention and what I about what I speak about in those moments. So I don't talk about specifics that can be wrong. Uh, if I talk about impressions I have, then I'm I make it clear that I'm talking about an impression and not a not an event and. Uh, um, I think that's an interesting way of going about it, and I think that it's a valuable, a valuable tool also. Yeah, well, uh, the, the two things that I thought of when you were saying that is, uh, is first, I think there is value in, in saying something at the end of the end, even if it's like 30 seconds, just kind of make sure everybody's all together. And, you know, as you say, you can kind of share some impressions or, or frame things for where you're going to go, you know, from there positive yep. or negative or whatever. Um, but I, I also had to kind of smile at the idea that, you know, if, if you're, and as you say, as long as you're saying it's impressions, it's, you know, it's one thing, but if, you know, if you're talking and trying to frame or prime the, the players, you know, what if you're priming them with the wrong things, just like, as you say, the factually wrong things, because, you know, you haven't seen it quite right yet. And, and the players are going to have their own inf emotionally influenced, uh, viewpoints on things that some will, some will be correct and some will not be. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, for me, th I was uh, I was thinking that there's there's kind of one exception to where I may get a little emotional with a team, and that's a situation where I thought the team just just checked out. Where after yeah. the match, you look at them and they don't show any indication of you know having or caring about the result or you know they're they're loose when they shouldn't be loose or or, or whatever where you just look at them and you go you, you guys don't get it right now yeah and i had to do that one time i think when i was at extra with the men's team um it, it was definitely not something that i wanted to do but i just felt like at that point there was a disconnect somewhere that i needed to, to address at that time and not wait until training Mm -hmm. get into yeah 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 definitely yeah I, I mean we come back to maybe the same idea so the same basic underlying theme that the different moments require require different actions and um you know hard and hard and fast rules maybe aren't the aren't the best way to go about things because by definition, they don't give you the opportunity to, um, you know, to address a unique situation, or they or they constrict you in how you address a particular situation, and and um, maybe this is another one of the the list of those things. Well, and I'm still waiting for you to talk about how, you know, your impressions of the match after the match could have, be heavily influenced by confirmation bias, <laughs> because it certainly can be. I mean. You, you just want me to talk about confirmation bias. <laughs> I can talk about that. I know you can. I can oh. talk about how nothing that you see actually happened. It's just your impression of what you think that you, or what you already think was going to happen. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, a lot. 
ought to happen. You'll you'll see happen because that's what you think is going to happen. Yep. Um, it's fun being a coach, isn't it? <laughs> you can spend all day just second guessing every single thing that you think and do. <laughs> uh, yeah, but that works pretty much with everything in life. But uh, there's a lot of stuff with coaching. Yes, yes. Relating a story, and this this feeds back into to my own reasons for going the way I went. The the worst thing I ever saw was a coach after a match, bad match, we lost. Um, the coach's mother had passed away not too yeah. long before the match, after a long illness. Yeah. And she was a supporter of the program, had come to basically every match she could, all that sort of stuff. And at the end of the match, the coach, who's clearly upset, obviously, um, just starts going off on the players about, you know, my mom was a big supporter and she would have been so disappointed in, in how you guys play today. And I'm just sitting watching this happen going, oh, my God, I can't believe she's doing this. And, yeah. it, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you don't even necessarily realize in the moment the implications of it because, um, because you're just in the moment and you're like, okay, you've always got the next thing you have to move on to or the next day's training, the next day's match, whatever the case. Um, yeah. But I happened to talk to one of the players in that team several years later who talked about how the, you know, the impact of that sort of post-match discussion. And it wasn't the only time that I'm not talking about dead moms here, but there were a few times where that coach kind of lit into the team after a poor performance. Yeah. And the players did not react well to that at all. They felt like they were being emotionally battered and manipulated. And yeah, you know, that's something that ha was happening over, a, a period of time and contributed to certain players, obviously probably not playing as well as they could have, if they were happier for lack of a better term. Yeah. Um, I, I, underst I understood that, you know, after my departure a year later, the, the, the team's captain because of this sort of stuff, just about quit in the middle of the season. So, you know, this, this has broader impacts rather than just how you make the kids feel on that certain day. Uh, as a uh, as a as a rule, I'm I'm not interested in and and don't approve, for want of a better word, of of that kind of emotional manipulation anyway. Because uh, I just think it's rude, I guess. <laughs> um, and I, I maybe I maybe I'm lucky with the the groups that I I work with. I work with professionals, so. They they have a, a certain level of motivation. Even the unmotivated ones are still professionally unmotivated, and and <laughs> so I can, you know, maybe, um, you know, maybe I can rely on a higher baseline of, of work, or or um, maybe it's just easier to find common goals among the group because because of that. But but. Uh, you know, I've, I've never been interested in in that kind of um, that kind of emotional manipulation. I, I think people people want to to work for the reasons they want to they want to work, and and uh, you just have to to find that reason. And after that, it's it's not really a it's not really a big issue. I have well, it, it's be, kind of, to be um, to be fair to, to yeah. Go ahead. I just. On that kind of emotional appeals, I, I remember being in a uh, in a club situation once after a, after a game, and the the sport director has come and and given the the team a, a speech about the um, about the red the traditional red shirts that the the club wore, and the meaning of the traditional red and what it was to wear that shirt and. And uh, I looked around the room and there was um, me, an Australian, there were three Brazilians, a Slovenian, an American, um, and four, four uh, what were the nationality? In Belgians, was it? We were in Belgium. And four Belgians who came from different cities. And I looked around the room and I knew that this, this appealed to... Uh, the tradition of the shirt was about the most meaningless thing that the, the sport director could have said at that point. And uh, that's a, well, and, and, 
And, and to be fair to this coach, I don't think she was intentionally trying to manipulate the players. I think it was more something that you've blogged about in terms of she was just expressing her own frustration and emotion at the time. And you know, you've talked about, you know, why are we yelling as coaches? Are we yelling because we are mad and, and we need to really lead our, our, our emotions or are we yelling for a purpose? And oftentimes it's the former, not the latter. I, I think that it's nearly always the former because uh, <laughs> There's a, a convention I've been thinking for some since I wrote that post, maybe, or maybe more in general. I've just been thinking about the idea of coaches being angry just as a concept in and of itself. And, and really, why should a coach ever be angry about something? It's, uh, you can be unhappy, you can be disappointed, but, but, but anger is a really strong emotion for, you know, for, for a lack of execution for uh, for something, for not being able to, for a player not being able to execute a technique correctly or or for losing a point. Uh, anger, if I think, if I spend time thinking about it, and maybe I spent too much time thinking about these things, but it just seems to be the complete, a completely inappropriate um, uh, emotional response. Yeah. Yeah. Anger about outcomes is, is, pretty useless yeah because there's there, there's so many things in outcomes that you have no control over whatsoever yeah yeah um yeah I, I can i can maybe understand anger if if you're just not getting the effort if uh, uh that know. that's the one that's one thing if it's something that we've agreed on a certain level of effort a certain level of commitment um that we've previously agreed upon okay we can we can be angry about that but but uh, you know, hitting a ball out, missing a missing the block by a centimeter, and out by hitting out by a centimeter, it's not the uh, the intention of the player to make an error. And being angry about it, like I said, it just doesn't seem like an appropriate response to the to the magnitude of the situation. Right. Well, now I mean, this is tongue in cheek. What about getting angry at the referees? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, I read uh, there are some that we that we all know. There are some um, forums and Facebook pages, etc., where where coaches gather, and and it always st strikes me as uh, as odd that we'll have a lot of posts, a lot of questions about you know building the team and creating adults and. It was mostly junior coaches on the on these forums because that's they're the most active coaches, and about um, you know building character and respect and and a whole bunch of those kinds of things that are the meaning of sport. If you want to to get into some philosophical um, discussion, and then it'll be interspersed with just rantings and ravings against referees, <laughs> talking about referees in the most disrespectful way that you can imagine and and then of course you know those coaches the the coaches who are talking about developing their players characters and morals are talking about screaming at referees and and i'm um, just thinking there's a there's a disconnect just just there if you're talking about respect you're talking about respecting everybody yeah and, do as i uh, say not as i do <laughs> well, yeah, you treat your teammates and your opponents one way, but not those bastard referees because they're against you. I mean, it's right. you know, yeah, it's their fault that you lost. Not it's not the the, the thirty five mistakes that you made. Exactly, and and uh, you know, I I I, I used to. This is, I've changed a bit over the years. I I used to rant and rave and scream and throw throw uh my clipboard i i used to break at least one pen every year because of, from throwing them around and this is after i became a professional so when i was a young idiot and uh <laughs> and basically i i i changed one there was one day when uh, i for want of a better description just looked in the mirror and saw what i looked like when i was doing it 
Now, it wasn't actually me. It was other people. And I just said, oh, wait, that's what I look like when I'm being an idiot. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to look like that. And <laughs> didn't uh, didn't uh, David Schmeichel have a similar sort of, well, an epiphany? He wasn't necessarily looking in the mirror, but he, he realized he, he went to one of his son's soccer matches and his son was screaming at his defenders and uh, you know, was carrying on or something like that. And he said, huh, hmm. Maybe I should be a better role model. Yeah, well, it, it can be like that. I mean, I had uh, it was one game when I uh, I was there was a coach on the other team who started talking at me, and because I like to talk at that point to coaches and players and referees, and and for some reason I just looked at him and realized and just looked at myself. And then in the, actually in the same game, we lost the game and, and, and people from my club just started running at the referee and screaming at the referee at the end of the match. And I just said, oh, wow, that, that just looks unprofessional and childish. And, uh, yeah, and when I do that, I must be looking unprofessional and childish as well. Mm-hmm. So I literally, in the middle of a final series, I stopped from one day to the next, um, you know, having those those kinds of discussions, engaging with opponents, engaging with the other team. And uh, now I, on some rules, if referees get rules wrong, I tend to, to get a little bit uptight. But uh, on general net touches, all that kind of stuff, I just let it all go. And oddly enough, this might surprise you, but... My observation, informed as it is by confirmation bias, uh, is that I get way more calls from referees <laughs> than uh, when I screamed and yelled at them. Uh-huh. That's the, see, that's counter to the theory that a lot of coaches have, is that if they draw at the referees, it softens them up so they get the calls later. That is the, the conventional wisdom, which is informed by their confirmation bias. <laughs> Probably so. <laughs> All right, uh, we're running on time. So uh, just just swinging it back, I think, you know, Tom's big points were, you know, make sure that what you do at the end of a match, you know, isn't going to reflect your emotional state and lack of, of uh, full factual awareness yep. when addressing the team. Um and that, you know, sometimes you just, well, most of the time, you just need to step away, take an objective view, and then be able to address things much more properly in the next training session or otherwise with some space. Uh, I'm on board with that while understanding the power of um, controlling the or influencing the dialogue um, of the team uh, in the period until you see them next. Agreed. All right, we'll end it there. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. For show notes and more, visit volleyballcoachingwizards.com backslash podcast. Got an idea for a future episode or want to ask a question? Send an email to podcast at volleyballcoachingwizards.com.